people just not believing that like I created a platform that thousands of people are interacting with. So usually on some meetings, some someone would say, oh, so where is the CTO or who built the product? Hello, <laughs> I'm right here. I'm sitting <laughs> right in front of you. It's me. This is Boss Ladies. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on Boss Ladies. I'm so excited to have you today. Of course. So great to be here and honored to just, you know, get to talk to you and share some stories and my experience with the audience. Awesome. And I'm excited, everyone. I don't know if if people have looked this up already, but we both went to Cornell. So that's how we know each other. And, you know, that makes it even more fun. So can you start by just telling me a little bit about you and, you know, your career journey that led you to your role as CTO at Simba? Of course. Well, first of all, go Big Red. (laughs) But um, yeah, so currently I am the co-founder and CTO of Simba. We are Simba, not for the Lion King, but for symbiotic relationships. I grew up in a household where my father was an entrepreneur in the tech field. My mom was also working in tech and I was encouraged to, you know, either be an engineer, doctor, or lawyer. Very typical (laughs) of, um, you know, people in my background. Actually, what happened was I cooked a lot during middle school and high school. And my father came to me one day and he's like, okay, you know, we need to learn how to monetize your passion for cooking and let's try something out. So I actually coded my first website called nickatthiskitchen.com. And that was my first exposure into computer science. Little did I know that coding a website is nothing like actual computer science in school. (laughs) So yeah, I applied to Cornell University, um, studied computer science and engineering there, had a wide variety of internship experiences, including um, interning at Apple and Bank of America, Martha Stewart, and a couple of startups. And then right after I graduated, I um, really craved technical freedom. And I thought that a large company at that time wasn't the right fit for me. And I just wanted to go and get a faster paced environment and try something new. So I joined a startup based in Washington, D.C. While I was working in D.C., I met my now co-founder, Ava. And now we're both on this journey to help scale our impact in the remote and future workspace. Very cool. And you were recently awarded Forbes 30 under 30 in enterprise technology. So can you tell me a little bit about sort of what that means to you and what that experience has been like for you? Of course. Yeah. So um, we were both awarded um, 30 under 30 in enterprise technology for the 2020 class. In fact, I am the youngest female engineer on that list. So it's definitely That's amazing. <laughs> it's kind of cool to see. Well, first of all, it was really cool to be on that Forbes list because they brought in 600 different entrepreneurs that are tackling so many different industries and are all innovating and really acing the game in their space. But um, the Forbes community is amazing. There are so many incredible people there. And I'm lucky to be a part of that community, just to be able to tap into that network and get a lot of diverse perspectives and thoughts around anything from tech to music to arts and sciences to food. So there's a lot of cool people there. That's awesome. And have you been able to sort of network more with them? Like, what does it mean once you get featured? There was a little bit of networking in 2020. However, because of the pandemic, a lot of our in-person networking events were canceled all of 2020. So I am really looking forward to meeting a a lot of the other uh, recipients this year at some of the conferences if they, you know, if they have it at the end of the year. But, um, you know, there was a Slack community that was going on. There is an application, like an iPhone application. So a lot of networking was there as well as just, you know, professional networking channels like LinkedIn too. That's awesome. And can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, your role as CTO at Simba and, you know, where you sort of want to take this role and and what it's been like for you and what your day-to-day looks like? Yeah. (laughs) So, um... So my background is in computer science and technology and engineering, and I got really excited about using my skill sets as a computer science engineer in different industries. Uh, CS is so versatile, so whether that's in food tech, in this um, HR tech education space that we're in, or fashion tech, there's always a space for computer science to be involved. So as a CTO um, and co-founder of Simba, I get really excited about using technology to build the software that's helping us scale our impact. And that is to open up the workforce, allow companies to scale and offer more opportunities to people all around the world and have them adopt to virtual operations. So my day to day is really hard to um, hone down because no day is the same. (laughs) 
you know, I am also heavily involved in the sales um, with my co-founder. Both of us used to take a lot of the sales calls on together. I also do operations and some financial work. And th- I get to touch a lot of, of aspects of our startup, which is the beauty of having a really small team. But um, my day usually involves doing some business related work as well as working with my engineering team and building out a product and also managing customer success to ensure that our customers are having a great experience. That's very cool that you get to sort of dip your toes in so many different areas of the business. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about the fundraising process? Like what was that like and what has that continued to be like as you grow and scale? So (laughs) that's a loaded question. (laughs) Um, It was challenging. It's not easy. So Simba, we were part of a couple of accelerator programs um, throughout the beginning stages of our journey. And then just last summer, we raised a seed round with amazing investors. And those were investors that we built relationships with even six months to a year prior to us raising that round. And these were people that were true advocates of the work that we were doing, um, supported our team, supported our mission, and were really excited about just what Simba had to offer to the world. But the fundraising process itself was very challenging. Um, As a woman of color, as a female in technology, it was not easy. I feel that if someone else had been in my place and had just pitched the idea of Simba, they would have received money instantaneously. But for both my co-founder and I, even though we had traction, we had big, you know, sexy customers, we had revenue and like a growing team, it was still very, it, it was a lot of effort into proving why we were doing and what we were doing and what our mission was. And that was a challenge to fundraising. It was also during the pandemic time where people weren't sure of where to funnel in their money. So I think that could have caused a lot of imbalance in that fundraising space. But, you know, eventually we learned that a lot of investors were willing to invest money and especially into the future of workspace. But now we are gearing up to raise our Series A over the next quarter. So really excited to be reconnecting with investors and launching, you know, launching our vision and making a larger impact with Simba. Any investors listening, feel free to uh, <laughs> reach out after this. Um, no, that's that's awesome that you were able to sort of rise above those challenges. And like you said, I think the, the pandemic has really complicated any sort of investment in anything right now. I think people are being extra cautious and careful with good reason. So it makes a ton of sense. But I want to dive back into sort of being a woman in tech. And, and you know, you talked a little bit about how that's been challenging and it's been challenging fundraising and being a woman of color. Can you share some of what, like some of what those challenges are and, and strategies that you're using on a day to day to try and overcome those? Yeah. Um, so one example is people just not believing that like I created a platform that thousands of people are interacting with. So usually on some meetings, some, someone would say, Oh, so where is the CTO or who built the product? Hello, <laughs> I'm right here <laughs> sitting right in front of you. It's me. Uh, so I think that was, um, it's just a perception challenge where people don't, you know, people don't always think that I, in my position, could be the one who built out a platform and who has a really big vision, especially in the future of workspace. So to overcome that, it's all about confidence and just being fearless. It's about understanding that, you know, this is what you've worked hard to do. This is what I've actually built. This is the data that I have around why, you know, Simba is a business. And this mm-hmm. is, you know, why you should like, this is why you can be a part of the journey. And I think towards the end of our investing, um, or sorry, in the end of our fundraising journey, we shifted our mindset and we, you know, we really came to the conclusion where, you know, investors are lucky to be a part of Simba's journey and to get a piece of our pie. And that, you know, if, we don't, investors need us, you know, as much as, you know, if not even more than we need them. And I think that was really important for, that was like a key learning point for us because that helped us shift our focus and really just elevate our confidence into why, you know, we believed in the work that we were doing and the impact that we could have over the next five, 10, 15, you know, plus years. Absolutely. And what, what like are some suggestions you might have for other people in similar shoes? Uh, Maybe not necessarily uh, at the startup level, but maybe just being a woman in tech in general and and being in a male dominated space in general. Mm -hmm. The biggest tip around that. Well, so one of my um, advice is always follow your gut and not the recipe. And 
even as like a chef, I never really followed the recipe. I, my mom was always afraid of me burning the house down, (laughs) but (laughs) it's, you know, you have to do what's right to you at that moment. And it really comes back to like your mission and why you believe that you're the right fit for whatever role you're doing and why you, you know, we're all spending, we're putting our heart and soul into the businesses that we're trying to grow. And in the end, like we know our business best. No one else can tell us how to run it. No one else has been in our shoes before. And I think because of that, we all have, we owe it up to understand and admit that like our perspective is true. And that like what you feel is the right way to approach something, you should go for it. So I think it just stems from confidence. Obviously, you know, if you have a mentor or advisor who is really advising something or advising against something because they know that X, Y, Z can, you know, happen because of it, then heed that advice or take that advice. But in the end, just, you know, if you truly believe in the work that you're doing, you will most likely be able to, you know, put yourself in that path of success and be confident about what you're doing. You touched on mentorship there for a second. Can you tell us about some of your mentors and some of the advice that they've given you? Yeah. So my all-time mentor of life is my father. He's like my cheerleader. He is the one who has inspired me to pursue a career in technology. He was supporting me in the early stages of Simba. Um, in terms of like providing knowledge on how to launch a software platform or how to um, ensure that our customers are having a great experience. So um, I think throughout different stages of our startup journey, I've been able to touch and meet or like, you know, touch upon or just meet different types of mentors, whether that's a mentor in helping us with sales or with customer success strategies or giving us advice on how to build a robust technical platform. And, um, unfortunately I don't have that many female tech leaders to look up to. And I hate to say it, but I cannot think of someone who is a female CTO that has been in a similar path or has a background like I do, and I'm still on the verge of it. So would love to connect with anyone that can give advice. And it's definitely been a journey, but I've met a lot of other incredible female entrepreneurs, other female leaders that are tackling and acing in different industries across the world. And I've taken, you know, I've taken, whenever you meet someone, there's always one thing that you end up taking, like end up learning from them. And I feel like I've learned tidbits of some different advice from a lot of people. And that's something that I've applied towards my journey as being um, in Siva. Yeah. I mean, as you say that, I'm thinking about it too, right? Like all my managers in tech have been men, most of my, I think Damn. all of my mentors have been men. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's tricky to find that visibility. So I think it's amazing that you're, you're paving the way for, for other young women to look up to you, you know, in their careers. So that's awesome. And what about you touched on, you were the youngest, you said, I believe of the Forbes 30 under 30 class. What has that been like, you know, as you've been going through this process, not only you know, handling being a woman in tech, but also being a young woman in tech. Is that added any challenges or, you know, question based on lack of time in the industry? I think age is just a number. <laughs> so <laughs> agreed. Um, <laughs> I think I think it really is it depends on the industry and the business that you are working in. Because our sim or well, because Simba was first focused in the remote internship space. We are recent interns ourselves. You can't have a 50-year-old man telling us, no, this is the way that internships would work because I was just an intern a couple of years ago and I was I went firsthand through that experience. So being young helped in understanding why, like how to build out Simba. In fact, we'd built out Simba in the perspective of an intern and then built it from bottom up rather than thinking about like the legacy tools and the different HR platforms that are out there and that have existed for, you know, 50 plus years. So that helped in that sense. But yes, definitely people think, um, do you have enough experience? Do you know what it's like to close a um, X amount of dollar deal, or do you know what it takes to do marketing? And I think that if you're really interested um, in the work that you're doing, you'll find ways to learn those tools. So mm-hmm. yes, my computer science education helped me. My internship experiences helped me. I'm still learning every day when it comes to building Simba's products. So, you know, as long as I'm willing to go and learn new skills that I can apply to my work, then I think it's fine. Having an ex, like having years of experience underneath my belt doesn't really define who you are. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. what you're learning to make sure that you're able to consistently keep doing what you're doing at your role. 
Absolutely. Do you have allies in the space that, that you've been able to sort of team up with, whether at Simba or outside of Simba that have helped overcome some of these challenges, helped you overcome these challenges? It all comes down to like mentors. So getting professional advice from them, getting some of my friends from Cornell and um, also friends in San Francisco who are computer science engineers and just great software engineers. They've helped me with some of my issues while I was building out the product. So they are allies. Um, And again, in the end, it really comes down to like finding a person who's so good at their job, regardless of their age. I mean, come on, there are 14 year olds who are amazing software programmers. So when it comes to computer programming, especially, I can't really look at age as anything defining. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's interesting. I feel like sometimes there's this notion that you have to put in your time to have the right experience to be able to make the big decisions. And I'm kind of with you. I'm like, age is just a number. Like whoever is the most qualified person to do that job, that's all that matters. I mean, definitely like the more time that you spend on something, the better you're going to become at it. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, like when you make, if I make a mistake earlier in my career while I'm, you know, for example, closing a sales deal, then I've learned so much from that. And then you apply that knowledge for your next deal. And I think that that's part of the journey is like going through these experiences, learning as much as you can, absorbing as much as you can. And then from there applying the right or, you know, the right methods based on your experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So I want to jump topics um, again to to celebrate you because you were also featured in Crunchbase as one of the nine, sorry, one of nine South Asian female entrepreneurs changing the game. How, like, what does that mean? And, and tell me more about sort of how you are, you know, paving the way for the future boss ladies behind you. Thank you for that shout out. Um, so yes, like it's been an honor to be on that list. Um, there are you know, with the other eight South Asian leaders that were in the beauty space and tech as well. Um, it's truly such an honor to be listed with them. I think it really just paves the path for people like me to um, realize that there is so much opportunity for them and that they have like other people to look up to and a big community around them to grow and get to where they want to get to. And like I said earlier, there was, I never really had a strong female role model in technology that I could look up to and that I could relate with. And again, having um, been featured in an article like this, having been com- uh, connected with a big South Asian community through this organization that I'm a part of called Nate3, it has really opened my eyes to see that there are so many other South Asian women like me that are holding up C-suite roles in technology-based companies in Um, science companies and fashion companies like there's there's a lot of people out there and I think that exposure is really important so I have grown up um, you know I grew up very Indian Um, I am very proud of my Indian heritage though I was born and raised in New Jersey Um, but I go to India every year my parents are from India Indian food is one of my is my favorite cuisine and I speak Hindi and I've learned a lot of values um, from um A lot of the values that I have are from what my parents have taught me. And I think that has helped me bring a really cool, diverse perspective. Um, In fact, um, all the core Simba, like the core founding team at Simba, were all daughters of immigrants coming from different parts of the world. And that is, again, just brings so much cultural diversity and diversity of thought, ideas and perspective into our startup. I think that's amazing. And I'm, it's so awesome to see that happening and to see like, again, more visibility in all of these different roles and all different backgrounds and perspectives. Because at the end of the day, when you think about users of the technology that we're building, right, there, our users are always going to look different. And we want to make sure that we have a different group of price or different group of um, people with different perspectives, bringing those perspectives to the table so that we can make sure that the technology is actually something that, you know, makes sense for everyone and that everyone's going to want to use. Mm-hmm. I am curious, what is your favorite thing to cook? Great question. Um, so I make a killer chicken biryani. Um, that is my favorite food. Every time I come home, my mom has like chicken biryani, this Indian chicken curry and naan ready to go for me. Um, when I came back from San Francisco a couple months ago at home, my mom, in fact, had it for me in the car when I came back from the, like when I got picked up at the airport. So that's how much I love it. 
Uh, that is my favorite Indian cuisine, though. Um, I love spicy food. So any food that is really spicy and has a lot of fav- flavor is my go to. Sounds delicious. Do you see any future going back into the food space and diving deeper or going back into your website and continuing to pursue that? Definitely. I feel that, you know, everyone needs to be fed. So the food industry (laughs) will be um, going on for eternity. But there's a lot of, um, I'm really interested in the food tech space as well. Um, I love what I'm doing now and I'm excited to continue this and make a really big impact with Simba. I, you know, I joke around with my family and I tell them that when I retire or when I'm much older, I'd like to just open up a restaurant, have it operated by robots. So I get to put in some of my CS skills there (laughs) and make it a really cool, super tech experience. But um, definitely, you know, something in food. But food is a, like a side passion for me. So I cook most of my meals. I love dining out with friends and family. And it's really important. And as a founder, it's also really important to set aside time for yourself. So, you know, I try to spend at least 30 minutes every day, whether that's cooking, whether that's hanging out with my friends or family, going for a run, and just having something to give your brain a break. And to recollect some energy and to go, whenever you go back to your work, you're coming back at it with a fresh perspective. So cooking for me is the way that I de-stress. It's a, it's something that gives me complete power over something that I want to build in the kitchen. And I'm enjoying what I'm cooking and that's all that matters. That's awesome. I also love cooking for friends and family. So they end up <laughs> liking the food too. <laughs> so I'll be over next week. No, just kidding. Yeah, of um. course. <laughs> Um, no, I think that's amazing. And, and I can only imagine, you know, it, as someone who is working at a startup and it sounds like you're filling so many different roles and wearing so many different hats that the work-life balance is not always easy to manage. So I'm, mm. it's awesome that self-care and, you know, cooking and finding ways to take time for yourself has helped. Are there any other strategies you recommend for managing work-life balance, especially when, I, I don't know, you know, if your hours are really set, but it sounds like it's one of those things that you probably are, are working many different hours and many different time zones. And Yeah. So our team actually just had a conversation about this last Friday. Um, one thing that the pandemic has, um, you know, forced us to do is live in our space at home. We can't go out and work at coffee shops or co-working spaces anymore. So not only are we adapting to our own working lifestyle, but we also have to be cautious about our significant others that are around us or our family, our siblings, our pets. So one thing that I do really well is I block times in my calendar. So when um, I actually can be working 24-7, I have um, an engineering team that's based abroad and we have team members in America that are literally in every single time zone. So at any point, you know, well, first of all, as being a founder, there's always work to do. And the second thing is that there's always a team member that you can collaborate with or that might ask you for a question. So the best thing I do is like, I usually add time blocks. So I, in my calendar, I'm, I always put, or most of the times I put that this one hour, I'm going to work out or this one and a half hours, I need to spend time with my mom and dad while I'm at home and actually properly sit at the dining table and have dinner with them. There have been many instances where I'm carrying my laptop down to the dining table and I'm like eating, coding, eating, typing. <laughs> and they're just like, what are you doing? And many times my mom has actually had to come and drop off my lunch or my dinner at my desk. And I realized that that was not healthy for me. My mind needs a break. So adding time blocks in my calendar allows me to just take a deep breath and just do that and like be... Mm-hmm. Um, be good with my time and time management. And then a rule that I used to have in the beginning was like at least set out 30 minutes again, whether that's Netflix, FaceTime with friends, cooking something, or just going for a workout. And just when I saw that I would step away from my work and did something completely different, when I came back, that idea clicked again, or there was a new idea that came up or I had a new epiphany. And when I saw that happen, because I gave my brain a break, I tried to make more of a large effort to give myself that break. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And honestly, I need to do that more. And I'm sure everyone listening is also probably like, yeah, I don't do that enough. Um, Because it's hard. It's really challenging to, you know, when you're on a roll or you're so caught up in, you know, something or you have so much work on your plate to stop and take a minute and, you know, remember that it's actually going to make you more productive um, in the end. Can you tell me a little bit about your partnership with Ava and and co-founding, you know, Simba together and what that what that was like? Yeah, so we were both living in DC back in 
2017, 2018. Um, in the beginning of 2018, I met her at a Women at Tech conference that was hosted in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was wearing a really pretty blazer. We both have discussed how we have to like frame that blazer sometime in the future <laughs> at, at our office. It was like multicolored and tweed. Um, and I saw her and I just complimented her blazer. We were sitting at a round table. And after that discussion ended, I complimented the blazer. And then immediately we like kicked into conversation. She was telling me about how she... Um, used to be a fellow with um, late Congressman John Lewis and how she created this action project that was a marketplace and a place for students to have access to remote internships. And she was um, one of the first remote interns for the U.S. Department of State as well. And at that time, I was like, you know, this is so cool. Internships for me have helped me define what I want out of my career and has really like helped me understand what's good for me, what's not good for me, what it's like to actually be in the tech space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was like, you know what, I'd love to help out, try, you know, try working, you know, try building out Simba for you because she was actually also trying to scope out a technical partner and our, tech, our co-founder. And luckily we both connected. She asked me how, what would it take to build out something like this? And I got interested and I wanted to help her out part-time. And then when I realized that this is something that I wanted to go full-time at, I joined Simba full-time. Um, my parents were really supportive. They allowed me to come back home for six months. Um, I was staying at home with them, building Simba out. And then we both, she also moved back to her home as well with her family. And then we both ended up making the move to San Francisco. In San Francisco, we both lived together. So we're best friends. We worked out together. We cooked dinner together. We were working together. And I think that really added um, a great, strong bond to our like co-foundership, to our friendship as well. So we have like both that business relationship balance and just the friend relationship balance too. But yeah, um, both of us are constantly taught. We're 24-7, constant communication. Um, we're very aligned in our mission. Um, we're really good at what we do. So we have full trust on like she takes over what her responsibilities are. I take over what my responsibilities are. When we have disagreements, we're very um, practical about it. So we understand like what are the pros, what are the cons of each decision, and then are able to make decisions based off of that. So yeah, Sounds it's like a been, great partnership. It's incredible. <laughs> Yeah. And she's also Iranian. So she, um, very similar background like I have, and both of us have a lot of values and traditions that have also carried forth from our family, which has also helped strengthen our bond as well. That's awesome. And it's honestly very cool to see even like talking to you, I can tell obviously how passionate you are about Simba, but even more so about your partnership and friendship and building this together. So I think that's really exciting to see. Um, and I'm excited to, you know, watch Simba and see what happens. So I want to wish you the best of luck. But the last question I want to ask you quickly before you go is I always like to end on a positive note. So I know I've talked about a couple of them um, and mentioned a couple of them throughout the interview and you've shared, shared them as well. But can you share with us what you feel is one of your greatest accomplishments so far? <laughs> I think it's Simba. Like my, the impact that I've had on Simba, everything from the fact that I found or that I like bumped into Ava at a conference, we created a platform that has touched the lives of thousands of people that has allowed us to scale opportunities for people like us all around the world. And just everything that we've been through as two female co-founders together, everything from creating a product, doing sales ourselves with HR leaders, to being able to close fundraising rounds, being able to be featured, to growing and hiring a team and paying them salaries. I think just the entire process of Simba, I would say has been a great achievement. I've learned so much. I'm really excited to continue learning every single day. And again, just like our mission to open up the workforce is what keeps me like, what is what gets me excited in the morning. Also it keeps me up at night because I get so excited <laughs> about the work that we're doing. So, you know, we're on a mission to help companies scale and open up opportunities. The last year's pandemic taught us a lot about how we can work remotely. I'm really excited to help companies continue that path, if not like maintain hybrid operations. And, you know, there are so many qualified people around the world, so many students our age, as well as, you know, people of all ages that deserve opportunities like this. And they can open up their computer, intern for their dream company or work for their company remotely. And that's what we want to be a part of is to open up that workforce. And that mission is what drives me forward. And I would say that that, yeah, is my biggest accomplishment um, of being a Simba. 
That's truly incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on Boss Ladies today. Of course. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure uh, talking with you and sharing the story. This is Boss Ladies.